Hello, my fellow forgiven sinners. Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, in our Bible study recently, we've been going over this interesting quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. He wrote, A person will worship something. Have no doubt about that. We may think our tribute is paid in secret in the dark recesses of our hearts, but it will come out. That which dominates our imaginations and our thoughts will determine our lives and our character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship. For what we are worshiping, we are becoming. That's his quote. Uh, you see what he's saying there, though. Our actions inevitably reveal the things that we worship. That is, those things which we most fear, love, and trust in. Today we are considering, considering one of the clearest ways that our actions reveal what we most care about, our finances. How do we spend, how do we gain the money that we need for life? Again, money is a necessary part of our lives. We do well to recognize that. Let's not be foolish. We use it to pay for our food, for our shelter, our clothing, so many of our needs, right? Our uh, amount of worldly wealth has a huge impact on all, all different aspects of our lives, our standard of living, our careers, our relationships, in many cases, uh, many other aspects of our lives. Money can also help us uh, to accomplish a lot of great things, like constructing buildings, funding various charities, uh, and even ministries for spreading the gospel of Jesus. But it's this importance of money which makes us so susceptible to worshiping it. Again, remember, uh, what you worship is that which you fear, love, and trust in most of all. And so we very easily fall into fearing, loving, and trusting in money more than God. This is idolatry. And we need to be on guard against it. No matter who we are, whether we are very wealthy or very poor, all of us have this great danger of the love of of money. God has granted each of us a certain amount of worldly wealth, uh, and as Christians, as those who have been made rich through Jesus Christ with heavenly riches, uh, we want to therefore pay close attention to how we think about money and also how we use it. Today we are looking at Amos chapter 5, verses 6 to 7, and then verses 10 through 15, where God's prophet condemned God's people Israel for worshiping their finances instead of their God. Here we find God's warning to us today as well. May we, hear Amos' warning, turn from our evil, both in our finances and otherwise, and instead seek the good of our God so that we may live. Let's go ahead and read those verses from Amos chapter 5 now. There it says, Seek the Lord and live, or he will sweep through the house of Joseph like a fire. It will devour, and Bethel will have no one to quench it. You who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground, you hate the one who reproves in court and despise him who tells the truth. You trample on the poor and force him to give you grain. Therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offenses and how great your sins." You oppress the righteous and take bribes, and you deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Therefore, the prudent man keeps quiet in such times, for the times are evil. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you, just as, he, uh, just as you say he is. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy." on the remnant of Joseph. This is God's word. Amos lived at an interesting time in Israel's history. Many people in Amos's day actually would have said things were going quite well. Israel was, uh, as a nation, quite strong during this period. Uh, the people, a lot of people were making quite a lot of money and they were able to increase their standard of living in a lot of different ways. The nation as a whole was also doing quite well. It was expanding its borders as far as those borders had been under the great reign of King David. That was uh, some of the most powerful Israel had ever been uh, politically throughout their history. Uh, furthermore, it seemed uh, to many that all this wealth and power was a direct reward from God for their faithfulness. 
Uh, This was a time when a lot of the people were regularly gathering at the temple for the many different religious festivals. Uh, They were faithfully going about all those rituals that uh, the Lord had given his people. Uh, The offerings at the temple were substantially up, again, because of the the extra wealth of the people. Uh, It seemed that God's people were doing exactly what they needed to be doing and that God himself was smiling on their efforts. But then God sent Amos to reveal the truth. It was only some people who were making a lot of money. Those who were making the money used their extra power to take advantage of the poor and the weak. They were forcing people into debt slavery through uh, practices like predatory lending. Uh, the, The powerful were sexually exploiting women in desperate situations. People were cheating on each other in dishonest business deals and in various forms of currency manipulation. Uh, And the courts, which should have been uh, a defense for the poor, a way for the poor to seek justice um, against their neighbors who were much more rich and powerful than them. Uh, But the courts instead were taking bribes. And so they were enabling all of this evil to continue. Anyone who spoke out about this ended up with plenty of problems of their own. And so as Amos said, the prudent man or the wise man keeps quiet in such times. Maybe uh, that time in Israel's history sounds like another nation you know about, another time in history. Well, Amos showed the people that this horrible treatment of their fellow man was ultimately because of a horrible relationship between them and their God, that they had actually rejected God, despite how well their lives seemed to be, despite how much wealth they seemed to be pulling in, they were not actually rich toward God. Many of the people of Israel would have been shocked to hear such an accusation. Like I said, a lot of the people uh, were faithfully going to the temple. They were giving their offerings. But the reality was, and the reality still is today, that no one can love God while hating their neighbor. We cannot uh, worship the true God while harming and taking advantage of other people, of our fellow man. God teaches us that we are all children of the same God, that we are all answerable to him, whether we are high or low, whether we are poor or rich. Jesus showed us his love for every single one of us by dying for us, for all people. And so whenever we notice ourselves failing to love others as God commands, that means we need to reexamine our relationship with God. The people of Amos' day were taking advantage of each other in order to gain wealth for themselves. And then they saw that greater wealth as proof of God's approval. Do you see how screwed up a mentality that is? Amos showed the people that they were really only worshiping money. Even though they were uh, going about all of their religious rituals, they were not actually giving their hearts to God. Their immoral treatment of one another was proof of that. While God condemned uh, the exploitation, injustice, and cheating in which they were living, money was totally fine with all of that because it kept making them more money. And this this is where the, the true desires of the people's hearts were made most clear. They did not want God. They simply wanted more money. Amos called the people in his day to seek the Lord. He told them that this was a matter of life and death. Choosing the Lord meant they would live. Otherwise, God would step in and destroy this nation, which was supposed to be his special people. In fact, uh, as you go through the history of uh, the people of Israel, we find this a number of times, uh, that the people of Israel, God's people or not, when they fell into sin, God eventually would step in and stop their sin. No matter who you are, Whether you are a lifelong believer in Christ or otherwise, God will not allow unrepentant evil to continue forever. Sooner or later, he will bring destruction on evil. He will put it to an end. If you're a victim of evil, then let that be a hope and confidence for you. It will come to an end. But if you're living in evil yourself, let this be a warning. It will come to an end. Turn from it now or you too will be destroyed. Amos mentions the stone mansions that the people had built, the lush vineyards that the people had planted. The people thought that these buildings, that these uh, vineyards, uh, they thought that by doing all this work, they were securing their future, right? And it's the same thing today, right? A lot of people will uh, do various things with their finances in order to have future security, right? A lot of people will set money aside in savings or in investments, in retirement accounts, pensions, whatever it is. We think that we'll be okay, if we have our house paid off, or if we can just put enough money away for the future. But just like in Amos' day, 
these things do not actually save us. God was able to remove those people from those stone mansions, to remove them from those lush vineyards. And he can, in our day, remove whatever safety blankets we may try to make for ourselves. In fact, scripturally, God makes it clear to us the only sure investment in our future is repentance. Turning away from evil and toward the good that God commands. That alone can give us future security. Amos calls us to hate evil and love good. This is a really interesting dynamic here. Uh, there's, a many, there's a lot of people, I find, who believe that being a good person means you have to just love, right? You should never hate. But God does make it clear that we are to hate evil. God himself hates evil. Part of our Christian responsibility is to hate and oppose all that is wrong. Uh, as we've talked in the past, the first evil, the first and foremost evil that you and I need to hate is our own, right? We, we naturally uh, hate those evils of people around us, of people that are different than us. But ours is the most important evil that we need to hate and oppose. But living a life of repentance also means hating and opposing evil in the world that is around us. I find it fascinating here that Amos mentions that the wise or prudent men kept quiet in the evil times in which he lived. But you'll notice Amos himself apparently was not that wise. <laughs> uh, Amos did not keep quiet. Amos surely brought a lot of trouble on himself by speaking against the evil of his day. But it didn't matter because that was his God-given duty. I find that we also live in a time when you can get into quite a lot of trouble by pointing out evils. Many people consider it wise to keep their mouths shut. But God has called you and I to speak the truth in love. We cannot keep quiet in our God-given duty to hate evil, and to love good. Now, we certainly uh, can practice wisdom in how we speak about it, right? Blabbing on social media doesn't tend to do a whole lot of good, Um, but I can think think through very clearly what are the consequences going to me if I, going to be if I speak up in this situation or that situation. Uh, There's, there's wisdom in picking battles, but like Amos said, very often hating evil and loving good is a matter of life and death. And so we must take that seriously, and we must also accept whatever consequences may come from speaking the truth in love. What does all this ultimately mean for us today? Like we said, money is an easy idol for our hearts to worship. That was the major sin of the people in Amos' day. Maybe you're not uh, exploiting financially people that, that are working for you or things like that, but your heart is just as susceptible to the worship of money. Again, uh, back in Amos' day, it was that idolatry which ultimately led to every single one of those other wrongs that we talked about. Therefore, we too, whether rich or poor, we need to guard our hearts against the love of money. As we said, again, money is important. Let's recognize that. We do need it. Uh, But we cannot allow that money to become more important than God. Otherwise, we will fall into many of the exact same sins that the people did long ago. And we will earn for ourselves the same destruction that Amos warned those people earned. As Christians, our finances ought to serve God rather than God serving our finances. One of the simple ways uh, that we guard our hearts against worshiping money is by learning to give it away. God calls us to be cheerful givers. And so we do that in our offerings given to God at church, in our charity given to those in need, even in uh, gifts that we give to those we love. In all these ways, we can practice giving away money so that we can work against putting our trust in our finances rather than putting our trust in God. We also do well to examine the rest of what we do with our money. Do we uh, honor God with our financial lives? Uh, How do you spend your money? Do you spend your money, whether you're giving it away or, or whether it's the money that you are putting to use for the various parts of your life, Are you spending your money in a way that glorifies God and that serves your neighbor? Or are you spending your money in ways that is contrary to God's will? How does your budget look? Does your budget, if I sat down with you and we looked through uh, the ways you're spending your money, uh, does your budget reveal a heart that is committed to the Lord or is it committed to something else? One uh, huge problem I find for a lot of people in our day is that uh, they aren't uh, spending their money in, in a responsible way. Uh, Are you living within your means? Are you uh, being a good steward of the wealth that God has given you? 
I find a lot of people are, are not taking responsibility for their own finances uh, and they end up just month after month sinking themselves deeper and deeper into debt. That does not glorify God. Are we earning our money in ways that glorify God and serve others? Or are we taking advantage of other people by the way we take our money, by the way we uh, earn our money? Whenever we find evil in our finances or elsewhere, God calls us to hate that evil, repent, and turn to do the good that God has commanded. Amos' final, Amos' final words for us today remind us of the hope that we have. For whatever we have done with our finances, for whatever idol worship we have offered to money, the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on all who repent. He has shown that mercy in our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul reminds us of God's grace in financial terms when he wrote, Though he was rich, with the riches of heaven, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Again, what greater wealth could there be than the eternal wealth of heaven? And yet Jesus left all of that behind to live the life of a poor carpenter's son. Jesus didn't even have his own home, a place to lay his head. And yet he embraced that life of lack, that life of poverty, all so that he might raise you to the eternal riches of heaven. Therefore, having been enriched with this heavenly wealth, may we in gratitude praise our God with everything we are, finances and all. Amen. <laughs>